This is a CAD drawing of a journal bearing. You will notice that I have a shaft passing through the middle of a bearing, and the bearing has a hole in it through which we pass a fluid. We usually pass oil, but it could be any kind of fluid that you want. The fluid is then drawn into the space between the journal or shaft and the bearing, and the journal rides on a cushion of fluid. I put a keyway on this shaft just so you could see it moving when we do the animation. We spent a lot of time talking about rolling contact bearings, where we develop contact stress fields between the bearings and the races. Now we want to talk about fluid bearings. And the most common fluid bearing that we will encounter is the hydrodynamic bearing. The hydrodynamic bearings separate surfaces by a film of lubricant. The advantage of such a thing is that it is low friction. And if you take care of the fluids and keep all the dirt out of the fluids, then they're very durable. They can last a really long time. It does not require pressure because the moving parts pull the fluid between them. So that's why they're called hydrodynamic. The real big advantage of hydrodynamic bearings is they have high load capacity. They have a much lower running friction. They are inexpensive. They are quiet. They are less sensitive to misalignment and they have really good damping characteristics. The disadvantages are that they have a higher starting friction. And the reason is simple. Before the surfaces are moving relative to each other, they're going to just rest on each other with an elastic contact. The relative motion is what pulls the fluid lubricant in and separates the surfaces and allows them to glide on a film of fluid. They do not support axial loads. So you got to handle those in some other way. They need a, a constant supply of lubricant. So they have to be either sitting in a lubricant bath or they have to pump lubricant lubricant into the joint. Temperature has a big effect on the performance of the joint. And you can imagine that this is the case. Just consider motor oils. Viscosity of the oil changes with temperature and they do need a large axial space. So now that we have some notion of them, we got to talk about sliding on a fluid film. And for this, we're just going to imagine that we have a fluid film of thickness H upon which a block is sliding. We apply a force to that block and it slides with some velocity v and we know that at the boundary at the bottom this is a no slip condition so the velocity at the bottom is zero and the velocity at the top in the interface with the block is going to be v and if it is a newtonian fluid we will have a linear velocity profile from top to bottom and that makes our lives a little bit simpler so if we were to look at the change in velocity with position y if i put my xy coordinate systems as shown in red then if we have a Newtonian fluid, then that gradient in velocity with location y is constant, and it would be just given by the velocity at the top divided by the thickness of the film. And the other thing is that the shear stress required to shear that fluid is equal to a viscosity times that velocity divided by h. Again, we're using this linear velocity field from zero to peak velocity, and that's a Newtonian fluid. So in order for us to get something like Newton per meter squared for a shear stress, we have in the velocity, we have meters per second, and then we have meters in the denominator. So our viscosity units have to be Newton per meter squared, because we have to end up with that, and we have to multiply that by seconds. So our units of our viscosity are in stress time. And so in metric units, it's pretty straightforward. We call this mu a dynamic viscosity. So in SI units, the viscosity is in terms of stress seconds, usually written as Pascal seconds. In English standard units, it is given the term Ren after Reynolds, and it is going to be PSI sec. And we don't use any other units. There's so many bloody units in this fluids field that I just don't want to talk about it. But what I do want to talk about is how that absolute viscosity term mu varies with temperature. And I show here a plot for a number of different fluids from cast 
castor oil to 30 weight motor oil, water, gasoline. And you notice that most of them experience a change in viscosity. In fact, a drop in viscosity as the temperature goes up. And that's an important thing because that viscosity is going to affect the friction and it's going to affect the spacing of the joint. So in the intro, I showed a sample journal bearing where I have a shaft shown here as this inner circle inside a bearing, which is this outer circle. So we're looking down the shaft over here and we're looking at the shaft on the side in section AA and the journal bearing spans a length L and it has a clearance between the radius and the inner dimension of the journal of C and we have oil coming into the journal, into the journal bearing. It makes its way around depending upon the rotation of the shaft, the journal inside the bearing and then it comes out the sides. And so that provides a really low coefficient of friction, which doesn't use a lot of horsepower or kilowatts. So now let's imagine that we have a shaft that is spinning clockwise as shown here, and it is spinning at n revolutions per second. So n is in revs per second, and we have a weight that's applied to the shaft. And so we have to build up enough pressure to be able to counter the weight that is applied to that shaft. The way we estimate the pressure that is required is we take the weight of the shaft and divide it by the projected area of the journal. And so the pressure is going to be the weight divided by 2R times L, where L is the length of the journal. As I said, N is the rotational speed, and the rotational speed in revs per second, if we want to get that converted into something we understand, like meters per second, then we have to take this 2 pi R times N, and that's going to give us a measure in meters per second for the velocity. So we must develop a fluid pressure to carry the load, and we have already said that that fluid pressure, P, is going to be equal to the weight that is applied to the shaft. Think of this as the radial loads and all the bearings we were talking about, divided by the projected area over which you must carry that weight. And that projected area is just the cross section of the shaft, and that joint spans a length L. And so we have very simple relationship between the pressure and the weight that we must carry. Now, we already said the shear stress is related to dynamic viscosity through the velocity difference between the journal and the fixed bearing surface, and we divide that by the clearance C. So we have this nice relationship. We've said that the velocity is 2 pi r times n, and so the shear stress is going to look like this term right over here. The torque then is going to be equal to a force times a moment arm. And the force that we must develop is just going to be equal to the shear stress times an area times the radius of the shaft. And the area is simply going to be equal to 2 pi r times L. So that becomes the torque that we are applying. And if we substitute for tau, our relationship between tau and the dynamic viscosity and the velocity divided by the clearance, we get an equation that looks like this. But we also know that that torque is going to be related to a friction times the weight W. Weight W is a normal force. We multiply it by a coefficient of friction and it becomes a frictional force. If we multiply that friction force by the radius, it has to be equal to this dynamic viscosity torque term that we had before. That allows us then to solve for the coefficient of friction. If we solve for the coefficient of friction, we would just get something that looks like. And now what we are going to do is replace W with our expression for P, where the pressure required to carry the weight W is given by W over 2RL. So W is P times 2RL. We plug that term up in here for W. We rearrange and we get a, an equation that looks like this right here. This is called Petroff's equation. And so we have two dimensionless groups in here. We have a clearance ratio, which is the ratio of the shaft radius to the clearance that we have specified in the joint. We have a dynamic viscosity times a rotational speed divided by the pressure, and each of these groups is dimensionless. 
So that clearance ratio is dimensionless and the dynamic viscosity times N over P is also dimensionless. Well, Sommerfeld decided to write a dimensionless group as shown right here. And that number will show up again when we look at charts to help us decide what sort of pressures, what sort of clearances, what sort of heat generation and flow rate are required for journal bearings. Now, the most important thing we can do here is plot the coefficient of friction as a function of this dynamic viscosity related dimensionless group and that is shown right here here. We have the coefficient of friction against mu n over p. This linear portion out here is Petroff's equation. Then we see an inflection point and the coefficient of friction as we continue to decrease this dimensionless group. We find a really large increase in the coefficient of friction. This is thin film unstable lubrication and this is thick film stable lubrication to the right. Petroff's equation describes the thick film stable lubrication. And this point C is an important boundary that determines the difference between thin and thick film. And that point B is usually associated with a mu N over P value of 1.7 times 10 to the minus six. Now this is important because the dynamic viscosity is a function of temperature. It's going to go down as the temperature goes up. I want to go back to this friction chart where we plotted the coefficient of friction exhibited by the fluid against the bearing characteristic mu n over p, where p was the required pressure to handle the radial load that we are placing on our shaft. n, of course, is the speed in rotations per second of the shaft, and mu is the dynamic viscosity. And recall that the coefficient of friction is related to that mu n over p through 2 pi squared times the clearance ratio r over c. So the slope of this line in here is going to be 2 pi squared r over c, which means that you have already, as a designer, chosen your radius and your clearance, and then you would get the slope of that curve. If you increase the clearance ratio, that line is going to be steeper. Now there's two important regimes, and that is to the left and to the right of the point B, and we've already talked about the minimum recommended requirement of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6 for the value of B. But to the left of that point, we have thin film unstable lubrication. And to the right, we have the thick stable film represented well by Petroff's equation. So it's kind of important to think about this for a moment. Suppose we were operating at this point right here on Petroff's line, and we had an increase in temperature. Why are we going to have an increase in temperature? Well, we are shearing the fluid, which means we are doing work on the lubricating fluid. And when we do work on that fluid, its temperature is going to increase. We've already stated early on in this lecture that as the temperature increases, the dynamic viscosity will decrease. And so this mu n over p term will go down. And as the temperature increases, we're going to move down the curve to the left. When we move down down and to the left, the dynamic viscosity drops, the frictional work that we do decreases, and so the temperature will stabilize. And that's why we have this stable thick film lubrication, so long as we are operating to the right of the point B on this bearing characteristic axis. On the other hand, if we were in the thin unstable film region, we had a really thin film, and we were doing work on the lubricating fluid, let's just imagine it's engine oil, the viscosity decreases, which means we're moving this way, which means we're moving up the curve. The coefficient of friction increases. We do more work, which further increases the temperature of the film, and we get a coefficient of friction runaway, where the coefficient of friction becomes extremely large. So that's why this is called the unstable region. And for the very same discussion we had earlier, that is why to the right of the point B, we have the thick stable region. Now let's go and take a quick peek at how these bearings actually behave. So before we start rotating the shaft, we have a radial load applied downward on the shaft, and our shaft is going to start rotating. It starts at an initial speed of zero, and so it's not pulling any fluid with it. And because it's not pulling any fluid, it has no hydrodynamic lubrication, meaning we have dry contact, or essentially dry contact, between the shaft and the bearing. And remember, that part of the shaft that is completely 
completely embraced by the bearing is called the journal. Upon startup then, before we have developed thick, stable film lubrication, we have dry contact and the shaft tries to walk its way up the side of the bearing. Then as it starts to rotate, it pulls lubricant film in and transitions to what we have over here, meaning it slips down and to the left for this clockwise rotation. So if the center of the bearing shaft assembly is that point, we find that it moves over and to the left once it is fully running and once it has developed a fully stable thick lubricating film. And it's this distance of closest approach down here, H0, that becomes really important when you are designing your journal bearings. Now we show here we have a flow rate of oil, so we constantly supply oil to this and the oil seeps out of the sides of the journal bearing assembly. So we always have to have a supply of oil so that we can maintain this thick stable film lubrication and be certain that we don't approach closer than H not. We're going to talk more about that in an upcoming lecture. As the designer, you choose the lubricating fluid, so you have control over the dynamic viscosity. You choose the load per unit projected bearing area. You've already chosen a shaft diameter to give you infinite life, and now you are going to have to choose for a given shaft the length of the journal that embraces that shaft so that you can carry the load without any consequence. So you're able to choose the projected bearing area and the pressure for the given applied radial loads. We've usually called them W in this case. You have, as a designer, control over the speed of rotation of the shaft. And then, of course, I already mentioned, you control the shaft diameter. You set the clearance ratio. You set the angle of embrace. So if we look down the axis of a shaft, the bearing does not have to fully embrace the shaft if the loads are consistently pointed in one direction. So that angle of embrace is beta and you have a choice of that. And then of course you have the choice over the length of that journal. What is dependent upon all those choices however is the coefficient of friction, the temperature increase which depends upon the coefficient of friction and the rate of work that you're doing, the volume flow rate of oil that is required to keep the bearing under full thick film hydrodynamic lubrication, and the minimum fill thickness H0. That's what we're going to talk about next time.